Hey everybody, welcome back to Digital Media E10. I'm your host, John Selig, covering for Dan Armendariz today. Um, tonight's lecture is about video. So let's just dive right in. Um, we always start with assignment reminders. Project 4 is due when? Tonight. So uh, most of you aren't here, so you're probably still working on that project, and we understand. Um, but that's due tonight at 11.59 PM. And then you get a week break, which is cool and not really quite like us to give you a week break, so enjoy that. And uh, in two weeks from tonight, your problem set five and your final project proposal are due. So start thinking about those final projects now because we spend like the last month of the course working on them, so make it good. Okay, so first things first, where's Dan? Uh, so Dan asked me to uh, explain that. Um, here. Hello everyone, welcome to Digital Media E10. This week's lecture is from Stills to Video, and we have two very special guest lectures, the course's staff, John Selig and Shelley Westover. Next week, I'll return for the Color and Artifacts lecture, but in the meantime, I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Dan. So uh, a very brief video message, but he felt strongly about that, so I'm glad that he did. Uh, he just re was really sad not being here with you guys tonight. Um, another reason he was sad to not be here is actually, fun fact, tonight is my birthday. Uh, so this is the... Best way I can think of to spend a Wednesday night uh, for my birthday, so thank you guys for being here. Um, we're going to talk about digital video, and I'm going to go quickly because we have a lot of material to squeeze into for me about an hour, and then Shelley's going to take over and talk to you guys about post-production, which is a totally different animal and a very important one. So I'm going to divide my lecture into two sort of big concepts, the technical side of digital video, and uh, then we'll do the artistic side. So You'll see here I've shown the uh, Canon EOS 6D. It's a DSLR that works really well uh, for video. <clears throat> so we live in a cool time because in 2014, uh, most DSLRs and, and even you know, you know, four thirds cameras and just any high quality digital camera you get can now probably shoot HD video. This is huge because even 10 years ago, if you were an aspiring filmmaker or just wanted to do a video project or even get decent shots of your kids growing up, uh, video cameras were really expensive and they weren't very high quality, and getting lenses for them was crazy expensive. So now things have kind of shifted a little bit, and the barrier of entry has lowered uh, to digital video. So you can, get, um, <clears throat> you can get like a DSLR like this that can do 1080p, uh, what does that mean? We'll talk about that, but 1080p high quality, high def HD video um, for way less, maybe like a tenth of the cost that you would have needed to spend on a uh, video camera and a decent lens. So it's a cool time to be into photography and into video because you can get in there and make great looking stuff for way less money than ever before. Um, so let's just keep going. It's a lot like uh, shooting, shooting digital video on your camera. It's a lot like shooting digital photography on your camera. Uh, what are the three exposure factors that we talked about to death earlier in the course? the quietest person in the audience shouted them out. It's uh, ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. And so we're gonna talk about those each briefly here to talk about how they fit in with digital video. So you guys have probably already tried this on your DSLRs or your digital cameras at home. You just, there's usually a video button or you go into a menu and you select uh, video, something like that. Um, once you're in that mode, you still have many of the same options you have in photography mode. So to change your aperture, you still have to worry about things like focus and depth of field, excuse me, um, and you can still control that on pretty much the exact same way you can control it in photography, which is good news for us. The next one is ISO. ISO is also quite like it is in digital photography when you're working with video, um, with one important thing to remember. Um, video mode will let you do something called automatic ISO. I mean, some photography modes will let you do that too, where the camera you know, looks at the scene and decides an ISO for you. Um, but there's one important thing you should know about automatic ISO. Never, ever, ever, ever use it when shooting video. Um, it will change the decision it made mid-shot. Uh, so often if you start a shot, right, and a shot we're going to define here is just any chunk of uninterrupted video that you've recorded. So you hit the record button and the whole time it's going, when you hit the record button again, that's one shot. So when you start recording your shot, the camera will say, you know, if it's an automatic ISO, it'll say, okay, things are about this dark or this bright, and I'm going to go with ISO 200. Uh, but if you move the camera, or if it's a Wednesday, or really for no reason at all, the camera might decide that it made the wrong choice and it's going to choose ISO 400 now. So your shot is literally going to change drastically. You're going to get a whole stop's worth of extra brightness that you didn't ask for. 
Uh, using automatic ISO, I've seen it ruin many film projects. Seriously. Um, have you guys ever done the 48-hour uh, film project? That's a, it's a cool thing that you can do in pretty much every major city in America. And people get together and break into teams of 5 to 10, and they try their best to create a movie in exactly 48 hours from, you know, conception and writing to uh, production, pre-production, post-production, filming, all that stuff. Um, and I've seen a lot of those projects. I actually have a friend who, like, runs that thing. And um, so many times when you're, like, watching the screening, all of a sudden everything just gets brighter for no reason. And I say, this. So never use ISO auto when you're filming video. Okay, rant over. I apologize. Uh, shutter speed. Okay. So if, can someone define for me exactly what shutter speed means? When I say, you know, the shutter speed I used for the shot was 1 50th of a second, what does that literally mean? Yes. The length of time the sensor is exposed The length of time the sensor is exposed to light because it's the length of time the shutter is open, right? So when you're filming video, though, when does the shutter close? Right, it doesn't really. So shutter speed's a little bit of a different story when you're talking about video as opposed to photography. Uh, changing the shutter speed will make your scene brighter or darker, but you shouldn't think of it like that, and you shouldn't use it in that way. You know that when you're filming video, the shutter is open the whole time. That's how it works. Um, so shutter speed must be changing something else in that mode. And that's where we get into the thing that's a little bit tricky for a lot of people who are photographers who are taking their first steps uh, into digital video. So if we, uh, yeah. so if we go forward, we have to talk about something called frame rate. Right? So we all know that digital video is really just made up of a bunch of pictures displayed very, very quickly back to back to back to back to back, right? Um, and the speed at which those pictures or frames are shown is the frame rate. So video on the internet averages at 30 frames per second, which means in just one second of time, there are 30 different still images being shown back to back to back to back to back. Um, so that would be our frame rate, 30 frames per second, sometimes called FPS, right? So when we're talking about... Um, Shutter speed, we're actually talking about not the speed that the shutter is open, but it's, hold on one second, guys. I've got a slight issue with my PowerPoint. Um, I had like a really clever little thing in the notes, and uh, my notes aren't showing up. So there we go, and... All right. Sorry about that. So we're back. Um, so again, frame rate is the number of single images that you're seeing in one second of video. So a common one is 30 frames per second. That means in one second, we've got 30 separate pictures being shown in rapid succession. Um, back in the days of film, things were a little different, right? Um, you had to physically move a, f a chunk of film, right, a frame of film out of the way so another frame of film could come up to the light and get exposed as well. So we see in film cameras something a little bit like this. Um, there's actually a device that swings around and moves each frame of film out of the way so that each individual frame of film gets exposed and then it repeats and goes again and again and again. So um, we're going to talk about um, the 180 rule in just one second, but if you move something, what, what does shutter speed control? Sorry, I'm all over the place. What does shutter speed control? Like aperture controls depth of field. What does shutter speed control? Motion, right? So long story short, I'm going to try and speed it up a little bit. Uh, old film, cinema film, Alfred Hitchcock style stuff was 24 frames per second, right? Uh, we would see 24 different images in one second of video. So to do that, we actually have to have this little thing swing around and move each frame out of the way. The, well, let's call it the blur from moving each frame out of the way looks a certain way, and we're used to that. And so we want to create a natural blur, and shutter speed on your digital video camera actually sort of controls this. Let me show you a video which explains what I'm saying a lot better. Okay. So we need to figure out what the shutter speed is that we can use that will look the best when we're shooting digital video. So here, we have 24 frames per second and 1 50th of a second as our shutter speed. And notice the blur, right? We, the bicycle looks natural. Right? As it spins, the bicycle looks natural. 
um, which is sort of similar to the motion blur that our eyes see in nature. If we change the shutter speed, look how crunchy and artificial everything looks all of a sudden, right? So shutter speed is actually a really important thing in digital video. And although it doesn't work like we're used to it working in photography, I think it actually is one of the biggest things that sh can uh, make or break a film project. It's the difference between an amateur video thing and something that looks a little more professional. You guys can see the difference there, right? Um, so do, do you guys see the difference in the blur? Good. So if we talk about it in terms of this 180 rule, um, what could that possibly mean? If we go here, good, sorry. Um, basically, pick a shutter speed that is your frame rate uh, times two over one. So one over two times your frame rate. So if I'm shooting 24 frames per second in video, um, two times that would be one over 48. And that's the shutter speed I want to choose for my project. So again, let me back up a little bit because I kind of lost my place. Um, when you're shooting video, you never use ISO auto. You can use any aperture you want. And shutter speed should stay locked depending on which frame rate you choose. You can change your frame rate uh, using the menus in your camera like this. You usually want 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second. Uh, 24 is a little more filmic. It's a little bit more like you'd see in the old time cinema. And uh, 30 frames per second is kind of like the neutral video frame rate that you'll see on the internet and um, in video games and just most digital video. If you want, if you're going for sort of for uh, more of a narrative or filmic piece, 24 frames per second is probably what you want to go with. Um, so those are our two major options. We'll also talk about some of the other ones in a second. Um, but when you're deciding what shutter speed to choose, if I have a 24 frames per second uh, project, I'm going to say 1 over uh, 2 times 24 will be my shutter speed. So 1 over 48, uh, 1 48th of a second should be my shutter speed. Or if I'm using 30 frames per second, it's 1 over 60, right? So 1 60th of a second for 30, 1 48th of a second for 24. But our cameras don't let us get that specific with shutter speed. So actually, instead of 1 48th of a second, we're going to use 1 50th of a second, because your camera will have a setting for that. This is a really important rule. And it's something, again, that makes or breaks uh, video projects, especially when you're starting out. Um, you want to, it's super tempting when you're in a situation where there's not enough light, and you're like, oh, OK, well, I'll just change the shutter speed just this once. I'll just make it a little brighter, no big deal. Um, but then the video you shoot in that scene is going to feel differently than the video you shoot in the rest of your project. Just like the bicycle wheel felt different in uh, each of those two, uh, uh, those two clips, right? So the one that, was, that followed the 180 rule uh, looked natural, and the one that did not, did not. So let's just see that one more time. Um, so again, I recommend shooting one, uh, uh, I'm sorry, shooting at 24 frames per second if you are going for something a little more artistic. And if you shoot at 24 frames per second, you should be at 1 50th of a second shutter speed and you should stay there. Do not change it, do not be tempted. Uh, the light isn't worth making it look choppy and weird and artificial compared to the rest of your uh, video project. So shutter speed, for better or worse, is locked when you're shooting digital video, unless you want to get into a situation like this, um, which you probably don't. Um, consistency is important, and again, feeling natural, feeling filmic even, is a good thing to keep in mind when you're working digital video. So don't be tempted to change the shutter speed. Just figure it out based on the 180 rule, one over two times your frame rate, and leave it locked there, and you will be in good shape. Um, OK, enough about bicycles. Sorry about that. My uh, computer just decided to not have my uh, slide notes. But that's OK. I know this stuff. I wrote this stuff. Um, so we need to talk about now another thing. I mentioned 1080p. What is 1080p? Um, you hear it a lot with video. Maybe you'll hear 720p, 720i. What's this 4K business I'm hearing about now? There's so many different things in digital video that the numbers can be intimidating, right? Um, in photography, it's megapixels, but we don't talk about things in that same way in video, although it's similar in spirit. So let's take just for example one possible way your video can be uh, captured, 1080p. Um, when you see a number like this, the number on the left is the resolution of the tall edge of your frame. And the P stands for the scan type, which we're going to talk about in one second. So when you're talking about video, you don't usually say specifically 1920 by 1080 is the resolution of this video. Um, you can usually get away with just giving 
one number and that sort of implies the other value. So 1080p is a standard for high definition, whether that's HDTV or high definition video on YouTube or a video game, whatever it is. Um, 1080p means there are 1080 pixels on the tall edge and 1920, 1920 across the top. So 1920 by 1080, that is what 1080p implies. Um, the P stands for progressive, which just means that, uh, we'll get to that. So let's look at another one. You'll sometimes see it written as 1080p 24. So we were just talking about frame rate and that's another convenient way to write a lot of the technical information about whatever video type you're working with all in one spot. And uh, I just want to back up for a second and say these things are all changeable in your menu in your digital camera. So, you know, you, let's take a Canon DSLR, for example, because that's what I'm familiar with working with most. Um, you can just go in and say, do I want to shoot 1080p video or do I want to shoot 720p video? Um, do I want to have a 24 frames per second, a 30 frames per second, or maybe even a 60 frames per second, which we'll talk about? Um, all those things, you just go into your menu and you change. Um, 1080p is often, it's kind of changing now, but for a while it was sort of the best quality a DSLR would capture uh, for video. So 1080p 24 just means, um, again, 1920 by 1080 and progressive scan, which we'll come back to, and then 24 frames per second. Um, cool. So what does, uh, let's see, we can also go, uh, so yeah, it implies the dimension. So 1080 is always 1920 by 1080. Uh, 720p is always uh, 1280 by 720. Um, and 720i, which is something different, but note that the resolution is the same. So when you're talking about HD video, 720 always means 1280 by 720. Because it's a standard, they just omit the other number, so it's kind of like a shorthand, right? So it's always talking about the tall edge <coughs> for now. So now we need to talk about the difference between progressive scan and interlaced. Uh, thankfully, interlaced is kind of going the way of the dinosaur. You won't see a lot of interlaced video as much now. Um, a lot of actually standards organizations are trying to get rid of it. Um, and here's why. Have you guys ever seen that on one of your monitors? Um, that sort of weird motion when you're dealing with lines, it's like a tweeting or a, you know, moray of some kind. Um, well, this is what happens when your screen is deinterlacing video. So interlacing was basically, I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's less important now, um, but it was basically a way for data to be encoded and take up less space, right? So when you have progressive video, if something is 24 frames per second, you're loading 24 entire images uh, in the space of a second, right? If I have 30 frames per second, progressive, I'm loading 30 entire images in the space of one second. 60 FPS, 60 entire images in the space of one second. You guys probably get it. Um, but interlaced was saying, man, like that's a lot of data to load 30 entire images in one second. That's a lot of space. I have to be quick. We have to transmit a lot of data in a short time. What else can we do? So what interlace would do is basically it would load only half the pixels each frame. So it would, you know, if we've got 1080 lines of pixels in our video, uh, interlaced is only going to do line one of pixels and line three of pixels and line five of pixels and line seven of pixels um, each frame. So it's going to do the odd ones. Uh, for the first frame and then the even ones for the second frame and then the odd ones for the third frame and so on. So basically each time the frame changes it's loading half as much data. Um, so it saves space but it comes with problems when you're making an image that way you get sort of artifacts like this. It's not super clean, it's not as good quality um, and you know it didn't look great on certain monitors. My friend Gilbert Godfrey here can also help me explain. Um, is that moving? There we go. So you can see that when the deinterlace thing is clicked, uh, his hands look normal, but when it's not clicked, they look weird with lines because we're stuck in between two frames, right? I have no idea where this GIF came from. I don't even remember where I found it. I went looking for it again, couldn't find it. Um, I don't know why it's Gilbert Gottfried. I don't have no idea. But anyway, um, if anyone has a good Gilbert Gottfried impression, you're welcome to come up here and uh, give it. So. Deinterlacing is complicated. In order to make the video look good when you're only loading half of the pixels for a frame instead of all the new pixels for a frame, uh, there's you know non-trivial computational algorithms that need to happen to make that uh, look correct. And sometimes it's not always good. It has gotten better, but basically people are like interlacing is no longer worth the hassle. When HD video consumer HD video first became popular, um, you would see a lot of times it was it could do 720p 
or it could do 1080i, right? So because 720p is, you know, X data, but 1080i would be, uh, 1080p would be more data, right? So 720 again is, you know, this big and 1080 is this big. If you're going to use progressive scan, that's an entire new image every frame. That's a lot of data if you're doing 1080p. So some cameras could do 720p HD video, but they couldn't do 1080p, so they would settle for 1080i. It was a little bit less data to move and cameras could do it. Now we've reached a point where the technology is sort of caught up and you see progressive scan almost exclusively in new DSLRs. Um, which is good for us because it's easier to edit, it's less, uh, it's higher quality and you don't get things like this. Um, nobody wants that, right? So in the options that you can change on your camera for digital video, um, <coughs> we talked about frame rate, um, we talked about scan type, progressive or interlaced, um, we talked about to never use automatic ISO, and we talked about how to figure out your target shutter speed and how to leave it there. Um, but the menu I showed for changing those things, just the screenshot, let me see if I can get back to it. Bup, bup, bup. Yes, this one, right? So look at our options over here. Movie recording size. We can do 1920 at 30. Um, we can do 1920 at 24. We can do uh, 1280 at 60. Hmm, that's interesting. Or we can do 640 at 30, which is, I don't even know why they bothered with that. Um, it is interesting that this menu is not showing uh, the tall edge like is convention. They're showing the horizontal edge, but don't worry about it. So anyway, 1280, 60. That's the one I want to talk about real quick. Um, 60 frames per second. So as we talked about, you know, frames per second is just how many individual pictures we're seeing every second. So if we have 60, that's a lot of frames per second, right? That's a lot of work for the camera to capture, and that's a lot of work for the editing program to edit, and that's a lot of work even for the player to show. Um, so what advantages might having, you know, 60 frames per second offer us? Why is it worth the hassle? Why might you want to use a faster frame rate? Any guesses? Occasionally, you just want, um, you want that frame rate. Like if you're into video games, for example, video games are actually programmatically done the same way video is. So when something is happening in a video game, it happens in the time span of one frame. Um, when you are doing video, of course, we know the videos happen in terms of one frame. So super hardcore gamers, like my roommate, oh my god, um, they, they care about things like frame rate because if you hit the, the right button at the right time uh, in 60 frames per second, you can be very specific with that, right? You're being very specific when you hit that button if you're doing it on frame 54. But if you only have 30 frames per second for your video game, um, each frame is longer and you ultimately get less specific, less accurate. And so I don't really buy it, but a lot of my really hardcore nerd friends, of which I have many, thank you very much, um, complain when they're playing you know, the newest PC game, like, ah, oh, it's a great game, but it only runs at 30 FPS. I shouldn't even bother. I don't know. They're, they're just you know, being pretentious. But anyway, uh, the real reason you might want to look into using 60 frames per second is um, it gives you some more leeway when you're editing that you may be interested in. So let's take a look at a video here. Let's see. The bitches will love this. All right, so <laughs> we're going to show this video by a YouTube channel called The Slow Mo Guys. That's um, the intro right there. They, it's going to be The I Bitches them, Will Love This. Because Marks they down. get to make their entire <laughs> living just doing dumb stunts like this. Now recently, the um, government got so in touch with So check this out. I'm going to take a minute and watch this, like but because it's actually really cool. Was it? Um, yeah. oh, I know and he said, you need to make tennis more interesting. And um, we came up with this. Yeah, we did. Basically, this is petrol in here. Um, yeah, and that's the tennis ball. So. Soaking it with petrol, and I'm gonna serve it. Hopefully, get like a nice Hadouken style sort of <laughs> fireball type thing. Now, down. obviously, with it being caked in petrol, yeah, how are you gonna stop all the petrol from landing on your face and uh, arm? Uh, I've got a, a glove. Yeah, that, that was that's step one. Yeah, yep. glove. Um, a bucket of water, Mark 11 Alpha, and that's uh, we're good to go. I think. All right. Yep. Note, we don't need a canister, okay? <laughs> this is for facial protection, I'm not... Oh. <laughs> he gets annoyed when people tell him he's got a missing canister. Uh, he's missing the canister! I know that! <laughs> it looks like an angry Team Fortress 2 <laughs> moment. It is worth it, I, I promise. It <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Yo! <laughs> 
<laughs> Let me just ha stand here and admire the shot while my hand is on fire. Oh, that was a great strike. <laughs> <laughs> So if you can capture more frames per second than you need, at least twice as many frames per second as you need for your video project, you can do things like this. Now these guys have a really good camera that can do way more than even 60 frames. It's, it's, it's when I'm filming stuff like this that I just think, what on earth do we do for a living? <laughs> this is probably like, I don't even know, maybe 600 frames per second, I have no idea, but it's uh, really impressive to watch, and if you can shoot, let's say you're doing a, a video project that's going to export at 30 frames, but you can capture some video that's at 60, you can slow it down you know, twice as much. So you can get similar effects even in video you're doing if you can get that faster frame rate. All right, so you guys get, that's enough slow-mo guys. Um, but anyway, that is actually their living, by the way. How cool is that? They just got famous on YouTube and they just bought an expensive camera and they just take super slow-mo footage and they upload it to YouTube and make stupid jokes. And uh, good for them, good for them. So, um, we need to talk about a few more things. We've been talking about resolution. Um, we're also going to talk about aspect ratio. Uh, but I really want to sort of organize my thoughts a little bit here. Um, and a table is always good for that. So, when you're talking about HD video, that can mean one of two things. That can mean 1080 or it can mean 720. I've put 1080p and 720p here because they're the most common. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but it also applies to 1080i or 780i, but you don't see it, or 720i, but you don't see those as much anymore. So high definition can mean 1080p or 720p, um, and when you say 1080, it means you have 1920 across, 1080 tall, and the frame rate can be you know p or i. High def 720p is 1280 by 720, and again can be progressive or interlaced. Standard def, right? So you often hear that now used. That's a term that didn't exist until high def came along, right? It's used to sort of differentiate the two. That's at 480p. That's 640 by 480. And uh, if you look at that on a modern screen, it's quite small. So we actually dealt with relatively low resolution video for a very long time, but now everyone's a snob about it. Now it's like, oh, it wasn't even HD. Whoa. That's uh, my nerdy roommate again. So if we, that can also be progressive or interlaced. Uh, there's one other one we have to talk about, though. So Kind of like interlace is going the way of the dinosaur, we're not seeing it as much now. There's a new player in town, and uh, it's something that everyone in the video community is talking about. It's starting to catch on in terms of uh, consumer uh, level products. Um, 4K, also called ultra high def. So 4K unfortunately breaks our rule. So our rule so far has been if you see only one number, it means the tall edge. <clears throat> but 4K, they switched it. 4K refers to the horizontal edge of the video. So although it's kind of a misnomer, you see that in consumer level 4K video footage, we're going to get 3,840 pixels across the top, nearly 4,000, hence why it's called 4K, and then 2,160 on the tall edge, and uh, that's really big, right? That's very high quality. Uh, my first DSLR didn't even take photos that were that high resolution. Um, <clears throat> why do you guys think that on a given DSLR, if I can take a 18 megapixel whoosh, whoosh, photo, um, why can I only capture video that's 1920 by 1080? Why would that be the case? Storage and bandwidth limitations. Storage and bandwidth limitations, yeah. So um, that's exactly it. So storing, again, one image at a time, you can store a really big image because you're only doing one image at a time. But video, again, is 24 or 30 or even 60 frames per second, so your computer on your camera has to do a whole lot more work. And it has to capture that data and move it consistently over to the SD card. <clears throat> and all of those things are actually uh, pretty computationally intense. So uh, that's really what the limiting factor is. If you had an amazing supercomputer crammed into your DSLR, in theory, it has everything it needs to capture higher quality video, um, but uh, they keep it to these standards and that's a good thing because you would probably drop frames and all this stuff, so you don't want to do that. Um, but yeah, it's so much more data and effort to move video than it is to move photos, so that's why. Um, so anyway, back to 4K. 
Um, <clears throat> A lot of people are saying that 4K isn't really worth the money, right? Because if you were sitting on your couch and you're six feet away from your TV, you really can't tell the difference between 1080p and 4K video, right? So it really only matters if you're really up close to your screen and you're like doing work like that. Um, maybe like this distance you can tell the difference, but really uh, 4K hasn't caught on very much in the consumer realm yet just because it's unnecessary. It doesn't provide a very big difference for the person sitting on their couch watching Lord of the Rings movies on repeat. Um, so you want to be skeptical now. We're reaching a point where the technology is caught up to our abilities as humans, and we don't necessarily need to spend all this extra money on the newest Samsung 4K television for my living room, because if I'm sitting six feet away, I really can't tell the difference between my current TV. Um, so keep that in mind. For video production, however, 4K is kind of useful. It's a double-edged sword. Um, when you're capturing at that higher resolution, again, you can imagine you're capturing way more data. It's more strain on your camera and your SD card and your computer. <coughs> I worked on a, um, a video project, a film project last year, and uh, it was my first experience shooting with a 4K camera, and it was awesome. I mean, the footage looked great. It was huge. It made editing easier, which we'll talk about in a second. But it was the first film shoot I worked on where there was a dedicated IT guy. Um, the data, I mean, the data we captured was just insane. I think after one day of shooting, we had seven terabytes, something insane like that. So there was actually a guy on the staff of the film crew whose job was to follow him around with a MacBook Air and a bunch of hard drives and just clean out the tapes as we went. Um, and or they look like tapes, but they are digital, um, and just manage all that data and back it up and make sure we didn't lose anything. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. I mean, I think that's incredible. We're, we're moving all of this crazy amount of data, <clears throat> getting these awesome pictures so much that now one of the most important people on a film set is the IT dude. Weird. Um, why is 4K better for editing? It's because if you have a project that you want to export, it's, okay, it's not better for editing. It's awful for editing. Shelly's over there about to die because I'm saying it's better for editing. Um, it's so, again, it's so many gigabytes and so many, just so much data per frame that your computer really struggles under it and your editing software struggles under it. And oftentimes you have to export all of your 4K footage into a different format so that you can edit it and then sort of have it put it back into 4K as the last step. It takes forever. It's a huge pain. So yeah, Shelly's totally right about that. But, in theory, if you shoot at 4K and you export at 1080p, you have more pixels than you need with 4K. And you can actually do an in-frame crop to change your composition after the fact. Um, because if I shot 3,840 pixels by 2,160 pixels, but I only need 1920 by 1080, I can sort of take my pick of which pixels I want to use, or I can shrink it down, or I can, you know, have some leeway there. And so that one little detail is nice for editing. The rest of it is a little bit tricky. Um, <clears throat> and uh, 4K does not support interlaced at all, which sort of further backs up my earlier claim that interlaced is kind of on its way out. Um, to give you a sense, I mean, I'm shouting out lots of numbers, and I understand that this is your first time with video. This is a little intimidating, probably. Uh, just remembering all these numbers is a pain. Here's a visual um, that sort of makes it real. So if you had a 4K monitor, um, that would be the red area. And to show you the relative sizes of all the other uh, major formats we're used to, uh, they're charted here, right? So look how much smaller uh, 1080p is than 4K. It's pretty cool. So there is a lot more data to work with there. And like I was saying a second ago, if I only need you know, a 1080p section of video, I can kind of move that green box around and choose which section of the 4K I want, or I can shrink down the 4K to make it fit into my 1080p video project. This might make a little more sense when Shelly brings up the editing uh, software. We'll see. <clears throat> so that is resolution, but aspect ratio is another important part of video. Um, there was some discussion in Skype about aspect ratio today uh, in our section. Um, so I want to talk about it here just to sort of clarify. It applies to photos and uh, video equally well. Aspect ratio, uh, the aspect ratio of an image describes the proportional relationship between its width and its height, right? Common aspect ratios, if I've got an aspect ratio of 4.3, it means that I've got four units across the top and three units on the side. That could be inches, four inches by three inches, that could be yards, that could be four yards by three yards, it could be meters or pixels or whatever. So when you say that something has a 4.3 aspect ratio, you're describing the shape really more than anything else. So you see that the, the, four, the horizontal edge on the top is a little bit longer than the tall edge, right? Um, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that you're only dealing with four pixels by three pixels. Um, <clears throat> 640 by 480 is a 43 aspect ratio, right? Because if you reduce those fractions, you can get to 43. Um, so it's really just sort of describing the shape of the image you're looking at. Contrast that with 16 by 9. This is sort of the more popular one right now. Um, a lot of mobile phones are 16 by 9. A lot of consumer grade TVs are 16 by 9. Um, and again, that just means that you know the top would be 16 units and the tall edge would be 9 units. And that sort of again describes the shape. Look at the difference between these. Uh, we've got you know 4, 3. And then we've got 16 by 9. 16 by 9 is much wider, hence the term widescreen. Um, and now with uh, digital cinema, this new standard is becoming um, more popular. They're 239, they just call it. They don't say like 4, 3, or 16, 9. They just call this one uh, 239. And you've got 239 units on the top, 2.39 across the top, and then one on the side. And look how much wider that is. So that's like wide, wide, widescreen. Um, so these aspect ratios are the ones that you find most commonly. Um, there's also 1.85 in digital cinema projection. Um, that uh, these they're both popular right now. So um, I think 239 is a little more um, popular, but it's it's close. Um, <clears throat> so and for the record, they call this 239. Um, they don't say 2.39 or they don't call it 2.39 to one. Um, so notice that if you reduce 16 by nine to uh, having a unit of one on the tall edge, it's 1.77 to one. And here it's 1.33 to one. So uh, that means you'd have 1.33 on the top and one on the side. So the numbers are, I don't wanna call them arbitrary, but four three is sort of the cleanest way this reduces, right? Um, and here 16 by nine is sort of the cleanest way this fraction or decimal would reduce. Um, <clears throat> over here they didn't even bother with the other one. They're like, just it's 2.39 to one, cool. Um, questions about aspect ratio? It's a little weird, but you guys can visually see the difference in the shapes. That's what we're talking about when we say aspect ratio. No questions? All right, let's uh, soldier on. So, now we need to talk a little bit about the artistic side of shooting digital video. Um, the good news is most of the stuff we've learned for photography applies here as well. When you're working on a film set, uh, they call the guy behind the video camera the director of photography. So, it's all the same. Don't let anyone tell you it's different. Um, but there's a couple of things that are different. So when you're focusing, if you have soft focus on an image, uh, a single photography image, sometimes you can get away with it. If it's a good moment or the lighting's interesting or it's a really cool subject, a little bit of soft focus, not that big a deal. Unfortunately, because video is shooting not just one image, but 24 uh, in every second, you notice little details like focus a lot more. So if you have a scene where someone's talking and they're out of focus, it's a lot more distracting on video than it would be having a similar photograph. You know, we can accept a little more soft focus if we're looking at a photograph. In video, it's a little bit harder. So uh, my advice to you guys is to always be hyper, hyper aware of your focus. Always, you know, use a tripod whenever possible um, when shooting video and uh, use what I call the super focus trick. I don't think that's actually what it's called. Um, but if you've looked on your DSLR, you might see buttons that look kind of like this. They look very much like the zoom in, zoom out thing we might see in Photoshop or any other kind of software we're used to using. Um, when you're shooting video, what you can do is, let's say I'm set up on a tripod, I've got my subject over there, I'm trying to focus, but it's kind of far away and I'm not exactly sure in this tiny little screen on my DSLR, Everything looks in focus on that tiny little screen, as maybe you guys have found out. So I wouldn't really know until way later, after my crew has gone home, after the equipment's broken down, after my actor has left town, whatever. If I'm a little bit soft in the focus, I'm gonna really be upset with myself for not making sure. So if I'm set up on this tripod, I can use that plus sign button to digitally zoom in. Now, we have, you know, tarred and feathered the good name of digital zooming in this class, and rightfully so. Why did I say that? Who says that? Anyway, um, so uh, digital zooming is terrible when you're doing photography. It is just like cropping it in Photoshop. It throws away pixels. You're losing data that you could just keep and then decide later when you're uh, not in the field and you have a better opportunity to do a good job. So digital zooming is bad. However, this is the one exception to that rule. When you're shooting video, you can digitally zoom in by five or 10 times usually on your subject. And while you're zoomed in, it's a thousand times easier to focus. So if I'm trying to focus on that 
back chair in the back row and I just try and do it by eye, I'm totally gonna get it wrong. It's far away, it's dark in here, my LCD screen isn't great, um, so I would totally get it wrong. But if I zoom in by five times or even 10 times, I can see every little fiber on that chair and I can make sure it's in focus. And it gets tedious doing that for every single shot that you do for a, for a film project. In fact, you might do hundreds or thousands of shots in one project, it's, it's a lot. Um, but you'll thank yourself in the editing room every time. Um, so I really recommend making sure you're in focus, using that trick if your camera offers it most do. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, huge. So because video is ongoing, right, we have aperture ISO and shutter speed, but we also have this sort of notion of time now. Um, artistically, thinking about how time can affect what we do in our frame uh, is, is a potential in video that we don't have in photography as much. Um, so let's look at uh, pull focus here. This is what pull focus is, right? When you have a frame of video and you start off focused on one thing and you change your focus during the shot, the camera is rolling as you change uh, your focus. This is also sometimes called a rack focus. So again, the shot starts and we've got the foreground kitty in focus and then uh, we change it as, the, as we're still rolling to the background kitty. Make sense? So when you start focused on one thing in the beginning of a shot and you end up focused on another at the end of the shot, that's called a pull focus or a rack focus. And it's something that you see a lot in movies and it actually is really interesting. Uh, this gif is a little hypnotic, I'm sorry, keep, keep watching. Um, so it's something you see a lot in movies and it's a great way to sort of use the medium in an artistic way that we maybe hadn't thought of. Um, and it really helps you draw your attention from one thing to another. It sort of suggests where you should bring your eyes without forcing a, a cut um, in the editing room. So uh, it can be really powerful to do in your scene, but it's also hard to pull off. Um, making this actually work is tricky because you have to start off perfectly focused and then while you're rolling without moving the camera, you have to perfectly focus onto the uh, second subject, right? So that is tough to do. Um, there's equipment you can buy that makes it easier for sure. And people who've been doing video for a long time kind of have that steady hand and, you know, uh, that's why they make the big bucks, I guess. But it's, uh, again, something that's worth trying to, it makes, it's a production value thing that'll make your project seem uh, even more impressive. So here's an example of it being used in a movie. Can anyone name that movie? Good, neither can I. I just pulled it off of the internet. Um, so, but we saw two different uh, pull focuses in that video, right? Let's just look one more time. Um, so there's, here's a cut, another cut, pull focus back to this dude, cut, pull focus back to this dude. And then dramatic look. Um, so again, the pull focus did a great job of directing our attention throughout the scene and added a layer of, um, it's just one more artistic element you can put in a shot of video that you can't really do in a shot of photography. So uh, keep that in mind. And I wanna not go on too much longer because Shelly needs to get up here and teach you guys how to edit video, but I'm gonna do a couple more things. Um, I wanna just quickly talk to you guys about types of shots. I would love to get into composition and dolly zoom and all the cr and like accessories and all the fun stuff you can do with video. Um, but we've got limited time, so I'm just gonna give you the basics so you can sort of talk the talk a little bit. If you end up on a volunteering on a film set and someone says, oh, you know, can you, can you help me with this establishing shot? You'll know what they're talking about. So you guys have seen this. 20,000 times. All of the types of shots I'm about to show you, you've seen in countless movies and TV shows um, all the time. It's actually, when you start looking for it, you see that the shots used in you know, cinema are, there's definitely some exceptions, but you, it's the same four or five over and over and over again in 90% of cases. So knowing what to call them and how to talk about them, uh, that's helpful. So if you've got an establishing shot, this is just sort of a extremely wide shot of a place telling you uh, a little bit about the place. So, and there's actually a lot you can get from an establishing shot. You get your sense of uh, setting, right? You get your sense of time. Uh, we know that it's nighttime. We know that we are in a city. We know that it doesn't look like a super friendly city from the way they've set this up. Um, so they're actually really important. And you guys, you know, the 
the first scene in a sequence will usually start with an establishing shot to give the audience a sense of where, where, where we are. You'll also probably hear voiceover from characters, you know, sort of getting you ready to get into the action. Um, anyone ever watch Full House? I think every episode, yeah, one person, thank you for your honesty. Um, I think, uh, two people, good. I think every episode starts with an establishing shot of the Golden Gate Bridge. You're like, hey everyone, this is in San Francisco, right? Um, that's Full House, right? Am I, am I not, okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> um, so that would, that's like a, an establishing shot that has been used in every single episode so much that it stays in my mind even though I was like 10 the last time I watched Full House. Um, okay, wide shot. The sh it's like it's pretty much like it sounds, right? We it's wide enough so that we can see the full bodies of the people we're looking at, but it's not so far away that we can't see their faces or the look of terror on that little kid's face. Um, we get a pretty good sense of the scene we're in, um, with still getting some sense of how the actors are feeling about the scene. Um, so if someone says, "Oh, help me out with this wide shot," you're probably going to be picking up the camera and moving it further away from the actors, right? A medium shot is like it sounds. We are a little closer, but we're getting, you know, this is a pretty close medium shot, I guess you might say. Um, but we're getting a sense of, you know, maybe more than one character. We're getting a little bit of the body language of the character. Um, <clears throat> there's enough room usually to have a couple of people in there. Um, as opposed to a close-up, which is, like it sounds, a close-up, or the extreme close-up, which is an extreme close-up, right? So it, these are named in such a way as to be almost obvious, right? Um, but they're kind of always called these things. You, you see extreme close-up, close-up, uh, medium shot, wide shot, establishing shot, sometimes called an extremely wide shot. Um, and those are your bread and butter, right? So if you're sort of just starting out in video and you don't really know what to do, you have an, uh, an idea for some sort of funny little gag you want to put on YouTube, or the movie you've been writing for the last 15 years. Um, start with these, right? Get an establishing shot of where it happens, you know? Give me a wide shot of my characters walking through the town, give me a medium shot of them talking, and then one character breaks up with the other one, close up on the sad guy, and then the music gets really sad and sappy and a tear starts to fall, and then extreme close up on the sad guy, right? Boom, instant movie, you'll be famous. Um, Shelly, I'm sorry, I'm going to take 90 more seconds. Okay. Audio. So, ugh, nobody likes to talk about audio in a photography class, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a couple of things I need you to know, otherwise I won't sleep at all tonight. Um, when you're shooting your, with your DSLR, <clears throat> if you don't have a microphone plugged into the camera, which oftentimes you can't even do that, some cameras don't even let you do that, um, the camera will have like this crappy little cell phone type microphone built into it. Right? So when I hit record with my Canon DSLR, I'm, it's recording the sound too with this video. Um, it just sounds like it was done in an airplane tunnel. Um, and you don't really want to use that audio for anything except syncing. Um, so if you can, this is a little, so, no, if, never use on camera audio. Um, not in your final project anyway. Um, instead, you've got a couple of options. <clears throat> Again, some uh, video-focused DSLRs will allow you to plug a microphone into uh, the camera itself. Um, but if that's not an option, you're not out of luck. You can get some sort of separate recording device. On the left, we have the Zoom H4n, um, the so handy recorder, I think they call it. Um, it's basically just a device that is able to capture really good, high-quality audio. On the bottom, it has two inputs for XLR cables. XLR is the um, standard mic cable. You've probably seen them a hundred times in your life and maybe didn't know what they were called. <clears throat> uh, it also has a decent, better quality uh, pet, uh, set of onboard microphones at the top, you can kind of see. Um, and so, if you have to, if you can't get a microphone or you're in a situation where you can't do it, s using the microphone that's built onto something like that will still be a better bet than using the camera that's built into your, I'm sorry, the microphone that's built into your camera. Um, when you are capturing audio with a device like this, you've kind of got two major options for, uh, you know, filmmaking. You've got the lav mics, kind of like this that I'm using right now, um, that are sort of a little more discreet, not as obvious. You can kind of have them on the actor themselves and it's not, you know, not a big deal. Or you can use a mic like that, um, <clears throat> a boom mic or a shotgun mic. You've seen that thing, you know, people making movies and there's this unhappy guy with a great big pole and a microphone on the bottom of it trying not to let his tired arms make it dip into the shot, right? That's a, a cliche we've all seen a few times from uh, movies or TV about making movies. Um, 
and that's a real thing. That's often the best way to get the best quality audio from whatever it is, whoever it is you're uh, filming. Um, if you don't have a grumpy guy to hold the pole for you, you can mount a mic like that onto your camera. Um, and again, that's still much better than uh, the on-camera audio. So again, people often underestimate audio when they're doing video production, and that's a huge, huge mistake because we can actually forgive less than perfect picture way more than we can forgive bad audio. Um, anyone seen that documentary, Forks Over Knives? There's a couple of scenes in it um, where the audio is just garbage, and I don't know what went wrong or what happened, but that's way more distracting. I've been, you, know, you see documentaries all the time with less than ideal footage because they're actually out there trying to get good footage when something is happening. Um, but when you're just sitting there and you're just talking to a guy and the one camera on one dude, it could have been one mic and the audio is terrible, you gotta wonder what they were doing. And so it really takes you out of the moment when there's bad audio. Um, bad video, depending on how bad it is, we can kind of get past that and forgive that. Um, so don't overlook the audio. If you want any more information on this stuff, definitely let me know. I can make recommendations. Um, I'm going to wrap up in just 10 seconds. Um, there's a whole bunch of equipment that we can get now uh, that we could not have gotten even you know 10 years ago, um, especially for the price. So. Uh, I buy most of my equipment, I hate to admit it, on Amazon. You can get a decent tripod for 20 bucks. Um, it's not gonna like be the tripod that you fall in love with, but it's the tripod that you can throw in your backpack and get lost in the plane and you know, have with you at all times. That, you know. um, so the other thing I wanted to mention is SD cards, right? That becomes such, such, such a huge um, factor when you're recording video. You may have never even noticed your SD card really when you're doing photography, except for when it gets full. But the quality of your SD card matters a lot. One, uh, about a minute of HD video is about a gigabyte of data. So if you're shooting an hour of HD video, maybe you're going to a concert or a conference and you actually want to shoot for an hour straight, you've got to make sure that your SD card has at least 64 gigabytes. Um, and a 64 gigabyte SD card is still pretty big. They're still not super inexpensive. Um, you also have to make sure that you have at least a class 10. Um, SD cards are actually given different ratings and if you don't have a fast enough SD card, uh, your camera can create the video, uh, but it can't keep up with writing it to the SD card if the SD card itself isn't high enough quality. Um, so remember, class 10, uh, 64 gigabytes if you can swing it. 32 is good, but it's kind of a hassle if you have to switch out halfway. Um, <clears throat> again, I, any tripod is better than no tripod. There's a $20 tripod on Amazon. It's the Amazon Basics tripod. Um, and there's all sorts of stuff too. There's like a shoulder mount and there's like a little eyepiece you can mount onto the screen so that you can sort of hold it up to your, uh, your eye because interestingly, with video, the mirror is always up so you can never look through the eyepiece because the shutter's always open so the mirror is always up so the eyepiece doesn't work. So instead, what people do is you get this weird little tube thing, glue it onto your screen and hold that up to your face. Um, it works, uh, but it's not my favorite. Um, but there's so many weird filmmaking DSLR accessories you can buy, and um, I would recommend going as minimal as possible, as DIY as possible, um, but Amazon is a good starting point for a lot of that stuff because things have come down so much. If I had to, if there was a gun to my head, I would say get a Canon T3i because they're between four and five hundred dollars right now, and they do excellent HD video. They have a flip-out screen, which makes your life easier. I'm sure Shelly can give a recommendation as well. Again, for four hundred dollars to be able to do HD video is insane because ten years ago you would have had to spend four thousand dollars to get even close. Um, so yeah, so if you guys have any questions about equipment or stuff like that, just let me know. Um, yeah, and then I think that's where I'm going to leave off. So Shelly, are you ready to come up? All right, we're gonna take a five minute break. Thank you guys, and uh, we'll be back in five. Hi guys, so now it's my turn to play or teach. Um, I'm going to be talking about editing. Um, I'm gonna talk about hopefully three things. Uh, the sort of bridge between photos to video. So we're gonna just edit a really quick photo slideshow, then move to time lapse and video. So hopefully three things in this time. Um, I will be using Adobe Premiere Pro. That's just because what I edit on the most, it's what is on my computer, but most of the techniques that I'm going to be showing, you can use in Final Cut, you can use in, I think there's like a Microsoft version of a editor, you can use an iMovie, it's, they're pretty much concepts that are used all throughout Avid as well, but Avid is like serious production. But so yeah, three things, editing in Adobe, photo slideshow, time lapse, and video in an hour, go. So I'm um, starting 
opening up Premiere and like I said, we're gonna start by just bringing photos into a video editor. Um, these, Premiere, as well as many of these editors I mentioned, is an NLE, non-linear editor, which pretty much is like similar to Photoshop in the sense that um, it doesn't alter the media, the direct media that you're bringing into it. You can edit on top of that and then still save the originals. It doesn't like destroy or change your originals. So this is a really basic sort of layout from Premiere Pro. Since it's being shown from my laptop, it's squished. A lot of times editors have multiple screens, so everything is nice and spread out. So I kind of apologize for the squishiness of it. But down in this left-hand corner down here is for file management. And what I'm going to do for this is just bring in, not a whole file, oh, Andrew, some photos. I'm just right now just double clicking on the files and importing to bring them in. And what I will be doing is creating a new timeline. These are all things I also have to point out, I'm going to move very fast. If you have any questions about any of this, you can contact me afterwards, or we can talk about it online, for email. There's tons and tons of tutorials. You will not learn how to edit specifically just from this. I just wanted to give a really basic overview. So on the right-hand side, down in the bottom, is my timeline currently. Um, it, it has set up right now with three video layers. Just unclick them. But if you can see my cursor, three video layers and three audio layers, that's just sort of the standard that it came up with for the first time. You can adjust that over time. What I'm going to do to start is bring an audio layer in. And I just click it and drag it in. This layer, um, you can see my waveforms over here. It is. Hopefully. Can you hear this? No. Hey, Andrew. Can we hear? You can hear? The room can't hear. Sorry, one second. Program audio. Oh, you can hear audio? Yeah. Can you, you cannot hear that? One second. Technical difficulties. Extra on scalar. Preferences. Audio. You can hear that. And turning it down now. <laughs> How about that? Just glue the okay, cool, sorry, song. Quick thing that we're gonna do, we're gonna be adding photos to this song. So one thing that I just wanted to point it out, super simple to do, if you double click on the audio file, you can see it up in the top left. As you play, you can hit the M key, which means marker, and add markers to it. So if you have good rhythm, as you're listening, you just keep hitting M, which I will do for a little bit. Oh, oh, oh. On the left hand side, I can zoom in here a little bit. So I had markers from earlier, but now in here, you can see that there are markers in my music. And then down here in my timeline, you can also see that there are markers. So what I'm going to do now is pull some stills in. I'm just going to highlight a couple, drag them in, and now they come in at an automatic, oh, I should point out, these stills on the left-hand side of where the files are, you can see that their pixel size is the 5760 by 3840, and my timeline is 1080p, which John just talked about. So they are clearly much larger than my timeline. So what I have to do is highlight them, right click, go to scale to frame size, and they become the appropriate frame size. That's sort of another way, um, or similar to what John said earlier about when you're using 4K footage, you can bring it down to a frame size, you can do it that way, you can also crop in. I could have chosen to do just Andrew's nose before and just had that. Sorry, Andrew. Um, but so anyway, back to our 
editing. So you can see these markers here. I have snapping on, which you can see by this little icon here. You, it's also an S is a shortcut key. And right now, when I hover my cursor over an edge of one of these photos, I can pull it in till it snaps to this marker. And pull this one in till it snaps to the marker. Drag them over. Let's move my playhead out of the way so that you can see this cleaner. I'll just do a couple of these. One more. Oh. So, real quick now, when I play oh, that, oh, 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 oh. it will snap to the beat. So, a lot of times when you're editing photos to music, it's commonplace to edit to the beat. Actually, anytime you're using video to the music, it's even commonplace to edit to the beat. It makes your the viewer more comfortable watching what you're doing. So it's a pretty good habit to try to do that. And like I, do, I add the markers ahead of time to try to make it as, as easy as I can to do it quickly. Um, you will notice that my markers are not evenly spaced. I did not necessarily create them evenly. So you can go in, you can zoom in zoom in to the appropriate place and change them. Like for instance here, you can see this waveform actually kind of starts in there. So I should probably move this over. But like you, you can find, like tweak it after the fact. Um, so another thing you can do, sorry, oh, I'm all over the place with my zoom here. And I'm turning the sound off for a little bit. Another thing that you can do is put in transitions. On the left-hand side, above where our media is, you can see effects. And if you go to video transitions, there's a whole bunch of different transitions here that you can use. Um, right now, my transition, my things are kind of short to add a transition, but say, I wanted these two photos to be next to each other and for a much longer period of time. And then I wanted a dissolve, um, a cross dissolve between the two. What you'll see now is play from one to the other. I don't know if also, I might not have made it clear when I hit play, it's showing up here in this demo section. So I don't know if that was clear. Let's also mute this lovely audio for a little bit. So here, it cross dissolves from Andrew to Zamila. Um, there are lots of different dissolves you can use, or not dissolve transitions you can use. Like there's uh, the wipes, the reels, pages, like the whole page turn thing. Um, Premiere and Final Cut and all of these editors are kind of like, um, what is it, like Keynote or PowerPoint. Like it has a lot of features that you don't often want to use. Like it's, it's better to be really simple on them. Like when I'm editing, I might use a cross dissolve. I often use dip to black. I very rarely use anything else. But if you're creating a photo slideshow that you just want a lot of funky transitions in there, go ahead. Just know that Professionally, we tend to use as little of those as possible, or at least as um, the subtler ones. Um, we don't go crazy with a lot of the, the star wipes, but sometimes those are fun to add. Um, but you can add those, like I said. Um, also, I should notice, I, or I should point out, I just pulled these above because I wanted to show you a different length. The, this is built in a layer system, a lot like Photoshop. So on the visual side, every layer, I'll make this a bigger screen. Every layer that you put up is like that's the most that you're going to see that layer and not the ones underneath it, unless you change the opacity of that layer, which I can show you as well. In audio, every layer that you have down when they're not muted, you will hear them all. So if you have multiple audio layers, they're all going to play on top of each other, which sometimes you want if you want to add a sound effect in or something. But if you have multiple 
um, people talking or something like that that you're playing on top of each other, you want to make sure that you mute the layer that you don't want to use or cut it out entirely. You just need to be careful that not all your audio isn't playing at the same time. But go ahead, John. Sorry, two questions. Yeah. How do you change the volume of John uh, Good question. So you can sort of see this. When I hover over this middle line in volume, it has a little up and down arrow. And when you click on it, you can adjust that this way, drag it up and or down. Also, an uh, interesting shortcut, you can hit the G key, which then you can adjust the gain of everything by something. So I could, for this, for instance, I could normalize my max peak. So imagine each one of these little things is a peak. I want the max to be, uh, let's say, no higher than negative three. And what it will do is it will adjust all of it so that the max is at negative three. Cool. Is there a way to automate the process? Uh, you showed us of taking multiple clips and then all resizing them to, 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 to get the marker to play. <sighs> I don't know of that. I've seen it happen before in some editors. I I think it might have been like iMovie or something. In Premiere, it doesn't exist. At least I haven't found a tutorial that helps me do it. I always do it by hand. If you Google it and find it, share it <laughs> because it would be so helpful. But I do not know of a way to make that exist. <laughs> um, okay, and just quick one thing I said earlier. So opacity, one thing, when you do have any, pretty much anything, whether it's a photo or anything, on your upper left-hand side, before I double clicked on the audio and you could see it up in the source. When you double click on video, you have a tab called effects control. And then for that, like for right now, I could do the opacity at 50% so that I should be able to see Andrew on top of Andrew, which is actually kind of scary. I need to change that. <laughs> but like that's pretty much like you can change the opacity to have the layers be able to see uh, show on top of each other so that you can see those things. Um, you, there's also, if you noticed in here, you can change the size. Um, you can change like the positioning. A lot of times you may have heard of the Ken Burns effect, another thing that you seldomly. It, uh, only that one actually is kind of appropriate, but it's been overused in a lot of ways. But the Ken Burns effect, you can apply keyframes. So for instance, if I move my playhead to the front, wait, to the front of this particular clip, and then up here, say on scale, I hit this little toggle animation key right here. Oh, serious error. Oh no, sorry. Adobe Premiere on a laptop. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> da, da, da. Keyframes, maybe another time. <laughs> what are the most common transitions you use? Um, like on a standard video I use dip to black or dip to white if it's a predominantly dark or light movie. And then I use sometimes cross dissolve. Those are the ones that I tend to use. Those are also the aesthetic of my job or just of sort of what I like. Sorry, repeating the question. The most, um, so the transitions I tend to use most often are um, dip to black or uh, sometimes a cross dissolve. Um, but it's, it's personal preference or professional preference. It's whatever you happen to be working on at that time. Did that save? No, that didn't actually do what I had just done. Okay, I'll just show this real quick again. Make this bigger. Zoom out so that you guys can see it. So here's Zamila. Actually, this is a good example. You can see that this photo is not 16 by nine. So first, I want to scale in a little bit so that it doesn't have the black bars on either side. But then say I want to add keyframes. Please don't crash my computer. Please don't crash my computer. I want to toggle animation. At the front, it's already the 123. Go to the end of this clip 
toggle animation again and make it bigger. Now I just want to double check. Now when you play it, over a long period of time, you can kind of see it's zooming in. So you can do zoom in, you can do a movement, you can do other things like that. Um, it's commonly referred to as the Ken Burns effect. Like I said, it's common, it's really common. Some would say it's overused, but it is a very popular effect that you see um, in slideshows. Um, so that's basic. What was my first goal? A photo slideshow. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to show this real quick is because Final projects are coming up. You guys can start thinking about that. It is common for students who create a gallery of photos to put them in a photo slideshow in the end to submit it. You absolutely don't have to do that. Like You don't have to. But some students have chosen to, because then you can match them to music. You can sort of pick a mood. You can add a bunch of transitions. And also, one nice thing about it is that you choose the order with which your photos are, are shown. Um, and if you want to do that, it is definitely a possibility. If you want help with that, feel free to contact John or I. We can help teach you how to do it in more detail. But it's definitely it's a, a cool option for doing that. OK, so photo slideshow, check. I do not need to save this, although it is a masterpiece. Um, so the next I wanted to show was um, the time lapse. And you saw that I just like grabbed individual photos, pulled them in. I had to change the length of all of them individually. Another process that you can do is when I bring media in, oh, JPEG, I can choose one image from my, um, my import. And then down here, you can see this toggle for image sequence. If I click that, what it does is it imports all of the, of the photos that was in that file as a movie file. And then when I pull that into the timeline, it plays through it as a movie. This will be really jagged right at the moment because, like I said, doing Premiere on my laptop is not the best option. But so what it will do is it will play through all of them. So if you've taken time lapse photos, or essentially where you, like, you take a new photo every second, or every two seconds, or every 30 seconds, it depends on how long you want to do it, then you can play those in a movie back to back. And then if you want to adjust the time of that afterwards, there is a tool over here, which is a rate stretch tool, that I can then make this shorter, or longer, I can add music to it, I can add titles to it. I should point out, actually, if I go up to File, New, Title, Title, can add text, awesome title, Right now, it's white and small, so that's not that helpful. Sorry, I should vocalize. Over here on the right, you can see font size. If you hold it and drag left or right, it will automatically get bigger or smaller. Right now, you can see also that it's white. I could make this, like for instance, red. So now I have this awesome title on top of my video. And then down here, you can see there's now a new file or a new layer called title. And when I pull it over my movie, it shows up there. So like I said, you can add music behind this. You can add titles behind it. You can add transitions behind it. Um, you can change the length of it. Um, this one, it's not changing the individual files themselves, it's changing it as a movie. So it's not like I can, I could probably calculate how many photos are in this movie and then figure out how long I wanted each one to last or each still to last, but that's math and I just sort of wing it a lot of times. But so that's um, the time lapse. I just wanted to show, I don't need to save that real quick. This particular time lapse was created for 
CS50, the course I work for, and I wanted to show this because it's pretty cool. <laughs> and of tourists in front of the, the uh, statue. Um, th you can also see what John mentioned earlier, the 239, that's the, the resolution of this, or kind of 21 by 9, it, it's somewhere in between there. This was originally 4K footage, right now you're seeing it in 1080p. But, um, so that's what you can do with time-lapse type stuff. And then, okay, two down. One to go, video. Of course, this is the longer one, but that's okay. We are going to open the project with Dan's intro video from the very beginning of this class. I'm really, I'm crossing my fingers on this one. This is 4K footage, so here's hoping it works on my laptop because 4K footage likes to crash often. But I wanted to show you guys just some fun, quick things that we can do. Um, I have the sequence from earlier of Dan sort of talking. Um, one thing I should point out right away, you can see down here that my audio looks kind of funny compared to before. I have two audio tracks that came from the camera and one audio track that is standalone. That's because, as John alluded to earlier, we used a Zoom recorder to record Dan. So we recorded it with a lav mic with good audio. On the camera, we did have a microphone, but that camera is like 50 feet away from Dan. And you can see the wavelengths here. They're practically non-existent. This was a mistake on our part. Um, it meant that I could not automatically sync these two <laughs> pieces of media. It's one nice thing about um, a lot of the editors is you can highlight multiple ones, right click on them, and then choose synchronize. And then if you synchronize by audio, what it will do is it will compare wavelengths and it will put, the, put them together so that if, the, if you have like multiple camera angles or external audio, it will have them playing at the same time so that you don't have to do this manually. But the audio on this camera was so quiet <laughs> that it didn't actually register it. So I had to go and sort of zoom in on Dan and watch his lips as he was speaking and manually sync the audio to that, which is tedious. It used to be how you had to do almost everything. Um, now we're editors are spoiled by the synchronized features, but um, it's a good exercise to have to do every once in a while. But yeah, it's, it, it takes a while because you're literally moving the audio like a frame at a time just to try to make it so that it matches his lips. But that's what I had to do. I will not show you that process right now because it takes a really long time. But just so you know, so now when you listen to this, when he's actually speaking, if he's speaking, sorry, I might have to change Premiere again. Audio hardware, HDMI, okay. And welcome to hey. Digital Media E10. I'm Dan Armendaris, and today we have a very special guest lecture from the TFs. Okay, so you can see that we actually did this kind of like two and a half times. We did it once where he was at sort of the medium shot, maybe kind of close medium, but medium shot. And then he wanted to do it again, and so I zoomed out and did it out here. All right, to go. Oh, wait. Media E10. This week we have... So for the clip that I showed you guys earlier, I chose, he did really well in just like doing it quickly. So I was able to just like chop out when he started to when he stopped, be done with it, ship that. But what I wanted to show you that you can do is for instance... All right. Everyone. Speed up. Oh, no, we wrote. Wait, he's gonna say welcome. Um, right down here, these are our tools for editing, or many of them. There's a razor tool. Imagine this is like film. Like you have a really long reel of film, and in order to edit it, you literally take a razor or scissors, cut the film, do how many frames you want, and then cut it there, and then you have a smaller section, and then you tape it to another section of film, and that was how you put film together um, for movies. So here, what I'm doing is I have a razor tool. I'm gonna cut it right before he starts talking. 
Hello everyone, welcome to Digital Media E10. Okay, right after he says that, cut it again, highlight, the zoom in so you guys can see that, apologize for that. Highlight it, just like anything, I can cut it, which is just the, the X or, or command X on a Mac, just the normal cut tool, and then paste it over here. So now I have that section, and now here. John C. Lake, from the TA. Sorry, going to right before, right after he says, very welcome special everyone. guest lecture. I'm Dan Armandaris, and today we have a very special guest lecture. Sorry, I forgot the section that he just did. Doo -doo -doo. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Digital Media E10. Okay. Here we go. Speed up to that section. Everyone, welcome to Digital Media E10. Okay, so he just said the same thing, but now it's zoomed out. Let's zoom in a little bit. This week, we have a very special guest lecture for the, the From Stills to Video. Cut this section. Paste it on. So now, what you have is him. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Digital Media E10. This week, we have a very special guest lecture for the From Stills to Video. So you can see, like, I could go through, find everything that he's doing, put it back to back, and essentially recreate his introduction, even though I did it from multiple takes. And there is sort of one tiny, tiny output or outtake. He was really good when shooting this, but he does say, oh, wait, I want to start over. Like, you can cut things like that out. You can put them back in. Generally, when you make a cut in video, you want to change Welcome to Digital Media E10. the frame. Like in this, how I change from sort of a, a, a close up or a medium to a wider shot, you want to change that to sort of make the cut more comfortable. If I were to like remove a word and had the same um, sort of shot where it was medium to medium and his head went from like one direction to the other, it's called a jump cut and it's really awkward for the viewer to watch that. Sometimes that's a tool that you can use to make the viewer uncomfortable or a lot of times you actually see that in comedy type videos where it's sort of a persistent thing to sort of um, drive home a point that they're selling some sort of joke but if you're just trying to have a narrative piece and telling a story and not distracting your viewer you want to sort of avoid those jump cuts if you don't have multiple um, sort of camera angles to be able to do that you can and I know this is sort of contradicting what John said earlier, you can apply a digital zoom, but know that when you do, you lose resolution on your zoom. So if, especially if you do it too much and you go into a closer shot, if you can notice that you, if the, the pixels missing or something looks awkward, like that's defeating the purpose. At that point, you probably should just use a jump cut. Or you'll see some people add transitions in between them, like a dip to white or something like that, but it's sort of, uh, there's a lot of different strategies on how to make the viewer comfortable while watching that. But I also wanted to real quick show at the end of this, we have some footage of just Dan talking with his hands because he talks with his hands a lot. So right before he starts to do that, his hand is in his pocket. Cut it. Okay. Zoom in. We can get this again. He's also going to love the fact that I'm using him as a demonstration when he gets back. Um, so I'm just going to paste that little section a couple of times. And then on the second one, I actually don't want any audio for this. So in this case, I can highlight it all, right click, and do unlink, which separates my video from my audio. I delete all my audio. The second one, what I'm going to do is right click on this and choose speed duration and reverse. So what it will do, you'll see, is it'll show him and then it'll go backwards and then again. So I'm actually, I copied it too early. I'm gonna take that, copy, paste, paste, paste. So now we have a little bit of him dancing. 
I can, like I did before, I could go back and make all of these just a little bit faster. Wait, I do that again. Paste, paste, paste. I'm dancing again. And I wanted. way way too much sorry about the loudness drag ooh, drag some music under that now this will not be to the beat but or play it all oh it's on mute <laughs> We have Dan dancing, and there's just a bunch of different like fun techniques, things that you can do. <laughs> See? Dan dancing. Um, <laughs> so I've gone over a lot, and there are, there, I mean, there's so much more that I could teach you. There's the infinite number <laughs> of other techniques that I could teach you. Um, there's a lot of great tutorials online. There's a lot of great tutorials, especially as Harvard students. We all have access to lynda.com, but you can also, you can go to Adobe's website, you can go to YouTube, you can pretty much look up anything. Um, the easiest way to get all this stuff is just to play with it. Pull random files into one of these and just play. And at first, everything will sort of be crazy and it'll drive you insane and you'll make mistakes and have to do it again and again and again. And I'm sorry, it will crash your computer over and over again. It, it just happens. But um, it's like you can make a lot of really cool things and you can have Dan dancing for the world to see. Yeah. Not, yeah, not from this. I, like, I will be, oh, Andrew, what is an easy way to post an animated GIF? Um, uh, to be honest, I use an online GIF, gener GIF generator whenever I'm trying to make a GIF. Um, I don't tend to do them in, in um, Premiere. I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure there's a way. You can probably do it, wait. I should also point out for exporting. Okay, I'm going to the front of this clip of Dan dancing. And right now, what I'm doing is I'm hitting my I key, which is for in. And then I'm going to go to the end. Oh, let me mute this for the moment. Go to the end of this Dan dancing. And I'm going to hit the O key for out. And then if I go up to Premiere Pro and File, and I can go down to Export media and there are tons of options tons and tons of options i just want to make sure that this doesn't go somewhere crazy so i want to bring it to my desktop at the moment um and up here right now i'm exporting as a quick time it does not look like gif is an option I'm, i guess i shouldn't really be surprised by that but like h264 is generally what you see as an mp4 i could export this as a series of jpegs one of the ways, actually, I should point out, one of the reasons to potentially do that is then you could bring the whole project into Photoshop and make edits to everything that way. That is a really challenging way to make corrections to any of these, but you can. That also reminds me, I should show you guys color correction. Um, but um, I generally use, I export to QuickTime, which exports to an MOV, which doesn't really compress it. Um, outside of the video codec. And like, sorry, I'm not gonna explain codecs this evening because that would take forever. Look it up, <laughs> codecs. But um, Premiere struggles a lot of times when it is exporting and compressing at the same time. So it, my recommendation is to export as sort of um, the original media or in this sort like an MOV, a non-compressed version, and then compress it elsewhere, which you can do in, in media, it's called, or in Adobe, it's called Adobe Media Encoder. In Final Cut, it's called Compressor, I believe. There's a whole bunch of different things. You can find ones online. MPEG Stream Clip is another one. Um, use those to compress your media. Don't try to compress your media in your editor. Um, it can be done. It just takes a really long time. It like really 
freezes up your computer a lot of times. It prevents you from being able to do anything except that. It's, it takes a while, so it'll take a while to export anyway, but compress it elsewhere. Um, like I just said, I wanted to show you guys this. I'm going to mute the audio again because it is loud. Um, up here on the left-hand side, I have effects, the effect controls, which I showed you earlier, motion, opacity, time remapping. Those are the ones that come in standard. Down where my media is, you can see effects here where I showed you transitions before. And I can do color, three-way color corrector. Drag this up, and you'll see very similar to a lot of things that you see in uh, Photoshop and Lightroom color wheels. So for this, like for instance, I could decide that this whole thing is kind of on the dark side. So what I want to do is drag my whites bar in so that from where my cursor is, here, let me actually increase this here. I was over here. Where my cursor is, pretty much from this point up, everything that is within those pixels on the histogram, I am sort of forcing to be white, or I'm telling it everything after this point is actually white. And then for the left side, I could do the same, and for black, although this is already really dark, so I don't need to. But this is essentially changing the contrast of the video. Um, so I am sort of making my dynamic range more, making it use more of the color in here. Um, and then also I could say I want, like this is kind of undersaturated now, so I can increase my saturation, but it's too orange. I want to make it more blue. So I could pull this down here on the left-hand side. This is for my low colors or my, the lower side of my histogram. These are for my mid-tones. I should say shadows, mid-tones, highlights. Dan is probably more one of the highlights. I'm thinking he's kind of yellowish. I'm going to pull his skin tone a little bit to bluish. So there's a lot of different options in here. Also, this is just one of the color editor options. You can see like there are a lot of different things I can do in color. Um, fast color corrector, not great if you're potentially shipping something professional or that you want like viewed by tons of people or submitting for like a competition or something. But if you're just trying to like do something really quick, you can f do the fast color corrector instead. Here, let me delete that one, pull this one up. One thing that's nice about fast color corrector is it has a white balance. Of course, now that I say this, there's nothing white in this shot, but let's say that this wall was actually white. This is going to look horrible. I could click on it, and it will change everything, assuming that that's the white tone. So it's a nice, like, easier way, quick way to change color. Quick doesn't necessarily mean it's as high quality, but it's a way to do it. So all three methods that I showed, the individual photos as a slideshow, the time lapse or editing video, you can change your color. You can change your contrast. You can change your saturation in one of these editors or a different editor, a different specific color editor for video. Um, you could also edit the videos in Photoshop and then bring them all into this. It's different processes take different amounts of time. Um, John mentioned earlier video, if you're kind of out of focus and on video it's a lot more noticeable, you could take a video, save it as a series of JPEGs 24 frames per second or 60 frames per second or like so 24 like you could make each individual frame its own JPEG sharpen that in Photoshop sharpen every single frame and then bring it back into one of these editors and then you have it a little bit sharper it's a, like helps with the focus a little bit it just takes a lot of time to do things like that but you can do them um, there are a lot of different one of the nice things about the Adobe products this is sort of an advertisement is um you can pull projects from Premiere into After Effects or Photoshop or um, Audition is their audio or Speed Grade is their color. You can open all these projects in all the different software, edit them, and bring it back into something like this, and all the edits will be there. So it's kind of nice 
to have all of those to be able to work back and forth. Um, but it's all time consuming and takes up more of your computer's capabilities to be able to do that. Um, I could go on forever and we're almost out of time. So are there any questions before we sort of wrap it up? No? Okay. Like I said, I'll post some um, tutorial type stuff, recommendations that I have to the blog. Um, this video will be up. You can watch it again afterwards. And please feel free to email me if you have questions. I mean, it's really, we could teach an entire like lecture or entire semester just on editing video. Actually, it exists. Take Alison Sherlock's class. She's fantastic, except that she teaches in Final Cut, which is sad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're going to end early. Oh my god, something Dan never does. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> OK. Everyone, go watch Dan dancing over and over again. I'll ex I export that and put it on the blog. <laughs> yeah. Have a good night. <laughs>